Yeah, and you can even unvideo. Uh, it doesn't so, kill my laptop. Oh, okay, okay, just leave it then. Okay. Gonna, yeah. okay, I think we're ready here. All right, everyone. Uh, this is the, the last uh, formal talk before we have our uh, panel discussion. Uh, it is a great pleasure to have one of our team members for the AI Institute, uh, Pod Lipson from Columbia University. Uh, Pod did his undergraduate and PhD degrees at Technion before coming to the US where he did a postdoc at MIT in the mechanical engineering department, uh, followed by a stint at Brandeis, and he went to Cornell for quite a long period. Um, it only seemed like yesterday you went to Columbia, but now it's like seven years in, right? And so it's, it's been quite a while there. And in kind of a funny twist of fate, during that time at Columbia, he uh, took on an undergrad, Flores, who's now at, uh, one of our partners at University no, of No, it's Cornell. Know. That was Cornell. Cornell, sorry. Yes. And so there we are. So this is uh, all of it comes around. And so this team is very nicely interlinked and uh, HOT has been a great partner, very much uh, in the center point of thinking about building models from data, one of the real pioneers uh, there in terms of uh, this. He also runs the Creative Machines Lab at Columbia University using these principles uh, to guide machine intelligence, right? And this is a fantastic use of data and control. And we're just so pleased to have him here and to be part of the Institute. Pod, Thank you. welcome. Thank you. Is there Blinking red, is that okay? Can, can you hear me? Is it on? Can you guys hear back there? Yeah. Yeah, okay, awesome. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what I call the AI scientist, which is sort of a pun on this idea where we scientists are not, it's not about building the best AI that we can, it's about how AI is gonna do science uh, instead of us. It's a little bit of a uh, talk about uh, the future where AI is, 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 is the AI is a scientist, and we are instead of sort of puzzling over data, trying to understand the world, we sort of serve the data. Uh, we we call the shots about what should be looked at, but it's the AI that is really trying to infer what's going on. That's a big transition from how we have done science uh, over the last couple of centuries, really. But, uh, but I want to tell a little bit about the story of uh, some of the work that we've done in this area. We didn't set out to build uh, an AI that does science. We actually uh, looked at uh, different kinds of problems, but sort of uh, before we knew it, we started working uh, in this area. And I want to tell a little bit about sort of my background. I started my uh, research a uh, hundred years ago uh, <laughs> in the area of robotics. Uh, and uh, robots uh, today and back then also uh, were fantastic. They can do, they can work 24 seven, they're very fast, they're very powerful, they're very precise. They're, they're superhuman in almost any way you want to measure it, except one area. Uh, and it's important to know in cases of robotic uh, uprising. What is the weak point of robotics? And that is an ability to adapt to new situations. So robots uh, can't adapt to new situations. That is the, 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 I'd say the frontier of research in robotics is all about adaptation. Uh, and if you look at biology, it's not as fast, not as powerful, materials aren't as great, but biology is all about adaptation. So it makes a lot of sense that we try to look at biology to understand how to make uh, better robots. So, um, so this is, uh, so I started my postdoc working on this problem at uh, Brandeis University. Uh, this is the Bolin Center of Complex Systems uh, back on a good day in Boston. Again, not always like this, but, but uh, this is a good day. Uh, and uh, we started looking at how to build, how to breed robots. We said, let's, instead of sitting at a desk and building robots, we're going to breed robots. We're going to throw a lot of robot parts into a big robot simulator. And we're going to connect them randomly joints and motors and wires and all kinds of things. And we're going to reward them for being able to crawl, to move. The faster they move, the more we're going to duplicate these robots. Uh, and then we're going to see what's going to happen. So the idea was that you start with these building blocks and all these random mutations connect wires and motors really in almost a, a Rube Goldberg kind of way. And eventually you get some interesting things. So uh, we took the, the baddest computer we could find at the time. This is an Onyx 16 processor uh, computer with a base, it was the basement of the Vaughan Center. Uh, it was heavily guarded, it was a big deal. It's probably slower than your, your phone today, it was a big deal back in 2000. 
and we built a physics simulator again at the time 2002 just download one you actually have to write one from scratch we wrote from scratch and we threw this evolutionary process on the, the this uh, simulator and watch what happened now what i'm showing you here is a graph showing generations of robots every dot here is a robot uh and you can see the speed of the robot versus the time the, the generation uh and so I started running this thing. Uh, I remember hitting enter, walking away, coming back the next day was around 50. Here, nothing happened. All I'm seeing is piles of junk on the screen with wires and things, but nothing is moving. I come back the next day, we're here, nothing's happening. Uh, I'm thinking, okay, I'm not going to get back into position this way. <laughs> I'm not going to go anywhere. I'm about to unplug this machine, and suddenly, Something happened. Suddenly, this small vibrating, a small piece of junk, one of them starts to vibrate. It doesn't move very fast, it's not going anywhere, but it's moving infinitely better than other piles of junk that are not moving anywhere. And that vibrating piece of junk begins to replicate, and there's more and more of them, and they begin to vibrate in a better way, in a slightly more interesting way, and the speed goes up and up, and over time, it begins to get really, really interesting uh, design. So here are two examples of these uh, robots that came out of that process um, being simulated uh, in on the computer. Uh, I used every computer I could find. This one was a grand life. This one was at MIT. You know, everywhere I could find a computer, I made a screensaver and I begged people to download the screensaver uh, and run it for me. Uh, it was everywhere and I got these interesting designs that began, these robots began to, to uh, to appear. Then we uh, did something interesting. We took uh, a new technology that was just coming online at the time, 3D printers, 2000. We took one of the first commercial 3D printers and we printed some of these robots. These are two of the first, I think, 3D printed robots ever. Uh, and they are, you can barely see this. Then you can make the room dark, even more, more even darker if you can. Let's give a cinematic effect a little bit. Uh, all the way, please, all the way. That's yeah, I have some cinematic music coming in. I really need that, uh, <laughs> that darkness uh, for the effect. You can do it physically also. That's right. Okay. But uh, but these robots uh, are crawling across the, the floor. Uh, and when you look at them, you have to remember they're not fascinating. They're not going to take over the world. But they were designed by this entirely uh, sort of evolutionary process that, uh, that was kind of autonomous. Uh, so that was, uh, like I said, a thousand years ago. But here's a, uh, you know, if you fast forward to much faster computers today, we can simulate these things with uh, much uh, more fidelity. So here's an example of running the same thing with soft robots, with soft materials. We have hard materials and muscles that expand and contract. And when you do that, you get much more interesting designs. Here are evolved robots that have hard and soft material and they can do lots of interesting things. We're not able to actually build these things because we don't have the muscles. We don't have the, uh, the sort of materials to instantiate some of these, but they're still pretty cute. Uh, but we are developed and working on some material science to catch up with this design. Here's an example of an electric muscle that we've developed and we're going to use to try to build some of these robots. But if I go back to my story, back in 2000, we printed these robots that were falling all over. The media came, they loved it. Uh, in fact, the New York Times put it on the front page. Uh, they said robots are making uh, a robot, uh, they're going to take over the world if you, if you, if you read the story. Uh, and it was on the front page, and the editor told me this will never happen to you again. The only reason they put it on the front page is because there was nothing else happening in the world that was never going to happen to me again. It was right. It's never happened to me again. You'll never get this on the front page. But that day uh, was a dull day, and we made it. Uh, but that was enough for me to get my faculty position at Cornell. This is all we need. Despite whatever anybody tell you, it's about getting into the news. Uh, we, I was able to get into Cornell. This is a good point. This is Ithaca on a nice day. <laughs> All Ithaca usually looks like, but on a nice day, it looks like that. And I knew that I was not going to get tenure making plastic robots. I'm going to have to make 
<laughs> this is what I did. The first robot I built. Uh, this was a, a fancy robot, and I thought, okay, if I can make this robot gallop in the fields, I'm going to get tenure. This was my goal. This is an incredibly powerful robot. It has a paintball canister in the center of valves. This thing can do loops, loop de loops, do backflips, all kinds of things. And I, I knew it had the power density to gallop. I just need to evolve the control to make this thing run. So there's a big challenge. Uh, and uh, uh, we put this robot in a cage, uh, and here it is in the cage. There's a camera up here looking. This is the, the view of the of the robot. You can see uh, see this uh, red dot here, and you can see how the robot is moving forward. And we have lots of controllers. We're breeding controllers, neural networks that were controlling how these valves open and close, a function of time and sensors. And the idea was maybe. Uh, you know, every every controller gets a uh, time on this physical robot, like a rodeo show, and those that make the robot move forward get to crossbreed with other neural networks, and then we get eventually something like this report. So that was the idea. We left it running overnight in a big cage in the basement, uh, and uh, eventually we got these interesting uh, behaviors. Here's an example of some of these uh, behaviors. This is a beginning. This is a uh, Victor Zykov student who built these robots. Um, uh, you can see it, it gradually learns how to move forward, but uh, it's not what we were hoping for. It's not uh, it's not galloping in the field. Uh, and it's not going to take over the world. I'm not going to get tenure with this for sure. <laughs> we had to do something more than that. So I was kind of disappointed uh, at this point. And if you step, take a step back, I showed you two projects. If I compare them, here's the key difference. The first one, I, I did everything in simulation. I bred things in simulation, and then I built it in reality, and it worked. But it only worked because the robots were really, really simple. In practice, it doesn't scale. It doesn't scale because what we call the simulation reality gap. The more complex the robot, the more complex the dynamical system, what works in simulation does not work in reality. And that gap is hard to cross. Sometimes it's called a sim to real. Uh, when we did it, we didn't have a cool name for it. We called it simulation reality gap. But that plays anybody who's trying to design anything complicated. It has to look like an aircraft has to move from simulation to reality. The second approach that I showed you was there's no simulation. We did everything on the physical robot in the cage. So that should be perfect. But there's a different challenge here. The challenge there, it just takes too many physical trials. There's a limit to how many physical trials you can do overnight, maybe 100, 200, 1,000. That's not enough to collect and control and learn to control something in a, in a complex way. So we suck between these two approaches. Simulation doesn't scale. Physical world doesn't scale either. So what do we do? So the third approach I'm going to show you is kind of a hybrid, where I start with a simulator. And I put it in quotes because it's going to be a bad simulator. A crappy simulator. In fact, it could be a simulator that knows nothing at all. We use it to breed robots. We build our first robot. The first robot is not going to work well because it was bred in a bad simulator. And nonetheless, to collect data about actuation and sensation, road motor commands, and what the robot senses, accelerations, for example. We take all that data and we use it to breed better simulators. And then we take the best simulator, we use that to breed better robots, and we go in a circle. In other words, we're not just breeding robots, we are learning also about the physics. These two things are co-evolving at the same time. Sometimes it's called co-evolution. More recently, it's called adversarial learning. But the basic idea here is that you have two things learning at the same time, and the relationship between them is a little bit adversarial. They're all feeding on the weakness of the other, but they're also both making progress. Sort of like student professor relationship, right? <laughs> kind of gradually moving forward by looking, uh, by sort of challenging each other at the same time. And this turns out is a very different way of working. So let me show you how that works. I have my uh, third robot. It's a it's a it's a four legged robot, and it leads uh, to uh, learning how to walk. But the challenge for this robot is that it is blind. It has no clue what it is. This robot does not know 
if it's a spider, if it's a tree, if it's a worm, if it's a robotic arm, has no clue what it is. All that he knows is it has it has eight motors, uh, two on each uh, leg, and it has two tilt sensors. Right? But you need to you need to move forward. But it doesn't know what it is. So imagine yourself for a moment sitting in a black box, no windows. All you have in front of you are eight knobs. And as you tilt, as you change and move these eight knobs, you can feel the box looking left and right, forward and backwards, but you don't know what you're in. And you need to move forward. This is what this robot feels. This is maybe what brain of the newborn child. I mean, in its, it's in this body, it has all these actuations, but it doesn't know what it's in. Uh, and so the way this robot works, and I hope we'll see the connection to the AI scientists in a moment, uh, is as follows. It starts by making random motions and it doesn't know how to move forward. It then creates lots of hypotheses, lots of models about that sort of try to predict that are consistent with the data. And all kinds of, in this case, stick figures that, that match the data. It's spending a lot of time coming up with this, but because it doesn't have a lot of data, there are lots of potential solutions of what it might look like. It then figures out what's the next move to do. This is a green box that caused the most disagreement between predictions of these models. And this is the key thing. It's like a scientist who designed an experiment that causes the most disagreement between predictions of two competing theories. Because then the result actually measured will refute at least one of those theories. And so it looks for the action that causes the most disagreement. It takes that action, collects more data, eliminates some models, improves the other ones, and tries to disabigate those with more and more actions and so on. So it does that for a while until there's only one model left or a bunch of equivalent models. And then it uses that model to learn how to walk. And because the model at this point is indistinguishable from reality, what makes a model walk should make the robot walk in the app. So here's a, one of our first experiments. Um, and uh, this is uh, in on the carpet in the lab. So we plug in the robot and allow it to explore itself uh, and uh, unplug itself <laughs> and die. This reminds me of what uh, Alina talked about in the morning about exploring a little not too far beyond your uncertainty now. But you don't want to walk off a cliff, you can find out if you can fly, right? This is the, the, this, this the risk inherent in exploration. Uh, and so I will take the robot down a little bit, and here's what happens. So you can see here in the beginning, the robot has no, we're peeking into its mind, and we can see how it's beginning to model itself. In the beginning, it has no clue what it is, no, it doesn't know how the parts are connected and where, and how many arms it has, and, and what the joints look like. But after a while, about two days into the process, it begins to figure out it has four legs. It doesn't quite know how they're connected anywhere. But it begins to figure out how they're connected. Eventually, it figures out it has four legs, and it uses those this self-image to learn how to walk. It's not learning how to walk in reality. It's not learning how to walk by being programmed. It's not learning how to walk by doing trial and error in the real world. It's learning how to walk in its imagination in itself image and here it is walking for the first time in reality and you know we were hoping to get an evil spidery walk but instead we get this kind of lame way of moving forward but when i when, when you look at this you have to remember the robot did not do trials of walking this way this is the first time so to try to test this we did something very cruel we plucked off a leg <laughs> and we watched what happened. That's what scientists do, right? We plucked off a leg and the robot sort of, uh, suddenly there's a discrepancy between its self model prediction and reality. And its self image also loses the leg. And here it is learning how to walk in its imagination without this leg. The robot looks very sad. Well, we did put the leg back together again. The robot is happily retired in my office. But here's learning how to walk without a leg. Uh, and here it is in reality. And again, there's no sensor that said leg came off, switch to plan B. This is all spontaneous for this idea of self model So that was uh, a long time ago. That was back in 2010, uh, before deep learning. Uh, and we have to give a lot of clues about joints, and, and we have to tell it F equals A, 
or clues of our spiritual reality. But here, this is uh, 2019 deep learning. This is a robotic arm learning about itself. You can see in the phantom in the background, it has no clue what it is. Uh, and uh, uh, I, uh, I, after doing this for about a day, it begins to, uh, it basically learns what it is. And you can see that, that how it sees itself in the background as close enough to reality that it actually uh, allows it uh, to, to, do, to, uh, to do its function. In fact, we change the robot a little bit by adding a little piece there. And again, the robot, totally reality doesn't match its self model. It does a little bit of adjustment, and now it can continue moving forward uh, because it's self image adapt. And self image is the key to allowing continuous adaptation. So that was 2019. Fast forward another three years, uh, and this is work that we've just uh, done. Hasn't been published yet, Bo, uh, a volume of change right there. Right, this is a completely opaque model, uh, which is more of a probabilistic model uh, that shows how the robot is learning to see itself. Uh, and you can see this is a much more of a stochastic model. It's a little bit more probabilistic. You can see how the robot cloud actually looks around the model. And uh, I think that this is really sort of how we humans also see ourselves. If you close your eyes for a moment and try to imagine what your body actually looks like, it's hard to know if you reach out into space, how far does your uh, arm reach? It's hard to know. We have sort of this very crude self-image of ourselves that's very probabilistic, which we use to plan and to do things, and to climb trees and walk down the street, and robots are beginning to learn to create that model. Uh, so that's a very simple model. Uh, and uh, more recently, uh, here's, a, here's a, actually a kinematic self-model. You can see the physical robot on the left, the, uh, the sort of self-model on the right, and you can see it's, it's, it's really pretty close. and actually captures the whole dynamics and kinematics of the self-model. So as AI moves forward, these self-models become more and more complex. And I would argue that, again, our ability to imagine ourselves is largely based on this kind of ability. Now, I know there's, a, there's been a lot of questions about errors and accuracy earlier today. I want to give you my take on this, that, 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 that uncertainty and error are overrated. We engineers are obsessed with minimizing error. But the reality is that error is not necessarily a bad thing. For example, here's a comparison. You can see that the, this is the first robot that learned how to walk the, the, the red dots there are where one the random controller how it moves the robot. The black dots are where the robot's self-model predicts it's going to go, and the blue dots are where the robot actually moves in reality. Right? So you can see, like anything else in academia, this robot has an inflated self-image. Right? It, thinks <laughs> it can go twice as far as it really can. But here's the catch: an inflated self-model is not bad. In this case, it allows the robot to make the right decision. So having a, a, a wrong model isn't bad in and of itself, as long as it allows you to make the right kind of decisions. And this is something that uh, uh, that we sometimes, you know, again, we're obsessed with minimizing error, but, but error is not a problem as long as it doesn't make you make the wrong decision. In fact, sometimes error can amplify things that make you make the right decision sooner. So I think we have to change our, how we think about error, I'll talk more about that. A little bit. Just minimizing error is not necessarily always a good thing. Now, another interesting thing, everything I showed you up until now, the robot modeling themselves, which I think is a fascinating question, but what about robots modeling other robots? Uh, this touches on this very interesting area called theory of mind. We humans we model each other all the time. We try to predict what other people are going to do and what other things are going to do and how they're going to respond. And we do this all the time. I'm doing this right now. I'm trying to figure out if you understand me. You're trying to figure out what is he talking about. We're all trying to model each other all the time. And robots model each other as well. And I'll just uh, show one a piece of work also by Bo Chen, uh, where robots are learning to play hide and seek. And hide and seek is a fascinating game, not because it's cool to play, but because it is key in human development of theory of mind. Kids learn how to, in order to play hide and seek, you need to understand how the world looks like from another person's perspective. 
And these robots are learning to do that. This is hide and seek purely from camera, visual camera. There's no coordinates, the robots know nothing except their visual camera. But in order to play this, at some point, they must be able to understand to some degree how the world looks like from another robot's perspective in order to know where to hide. It's very hard uh, for us to know exactly how they're doing it, but they must be doing it because they're playing it real well. All right, but let me go back and rewind a little bit. We made all these robots that play hide and seek and do all kinds of interesting things. Uh, but the big question is, you know, can we start modeling things that are not robots? Let me go beyond that. So a student walks into the lab, uh, another student that says, take all that algorithm, all these fascinating things you've developed and apply them to any black box. Instead of modeling the dynamics of a robot, model any system that has inputs and outputs. In fact, if you can control the inputs and measure the outputs and change the inputs to disambiguate competing models, you can reverse engineer what's in the black box. And isn't that what we're all trying to do in science? Uh, so we took that. This is the same slide I showed you earlier. There's a robot training model of itself. But we're going to replace the robot with some experimental system. Could be a you know, bi biology in a beaker, could be stars in the sky. We're going to create, instead of making models out of robot parts, we're going to make models out of parts of differential equations, just parts. And instead of changing the actions that a robot takes to disambiguate its morphology, we're going to change the initial conditions of these experiments to try to, try to disambiguate competing models. So it's the same process I showed you earlier, but with different external systems, different data, different building blocks. But apart from that, it's the same thing. And now, one big question is who is going to do the experiments? Now, it could be a disgruntled human doing experiments for the robot scientists, right? Which is a little bit of a reversal of roles compared to how we like to think of ourselves. It could be another robot that's going to do experiments on behalf of the other, the first robot that's coming up with hypotheses. Or what turns out to be most practical is we collect a lot of data to a random sample, including a big database. And when the robotic scientist wants to come up with a hypothesis, it asks for an experiment, and we look up the closest data point we have in the database. All of these are different to the practical implementations to address this issue of who does the experiment. So the first thing we did is try this out on uh, on this bridge. This is a uh, this is a a walking bridge uh, on the way to Cornell. This photo was taken by Forrest uh, when he was a baby, <laughs> right? Uh, and you can see so walking into Cornell. See, Cornell is very easy to defend just in case uh, <laughs> uh, it is attacked. It's like this from all around. Uh, and but when you walk into Cornell, you always wonder. What happens if this uh, thing breaks? It's a pretty big fall. So we actually, what we did is we, we took the same approach I just described to you of actuation and sensation and applied it to the bridge. So we put vibr tiny vibrators on the bridge, vibration, we sense vibrations on the locations. From actuation and sensation, we gradually create models of what where there's a, a weak point in the bridge. And we move this, the actuation and sensation and so on. We can figure out the weak point on the bridge uh, a lot uh, faster and more accurately than conventional civil engineering approaches to help monitoring and observing. This is work done with working at Aquino, who is now at Duke. So, uh, so this is a, uh, a kind of interesting result. Uh, we applied it to lots of different things. These are black boxes of an electric circuit, a nonlinear linear electronic circuit. We co evolve actuation and sensation on the input and the output, and we can infer what is the electronic circuit in this black box. Again, but you have to co evolve in actuation and the sensation. You can't do it any other way, it doesn't uh, scale. Uh, but I want to show you how this works on symbolic regression. And we talked a little bit about symbolic regression. Not everybody knows what symbolic regression is, so I just wanted to do a little bit of a recap. You all know what uh, linear regression is, right? Right? I hope so. <laughs> Nonlinear regression is also easy, right? You give the computer a model and the computer tweaks the coefficients of the model. Symbolic regression is when you don't even know what the model is, but you just have building blocks. So if I show you this data and I ask you what is the mathematical function describing this data, what is it? Somebody. Not a rhetorical question. 
What? Wow. Epsilon X, yeah, pretty cool, pretty close. This exponent times the sign. If you're trying to do this in your head, you are taking all the building blocks that you know of, exponentials and trigonometric function, and you're trying to figure out how to put them together to get this shape, right? You don't want even concern about coefficients. So that's what symbolic regression is, all right? So this is a very useful tool. We scientists do this day and night, right? This is what we do. We take data and create models. And so, uh, so that's what symbolic regression is. Let's see if you can do this one. Okay, I'm joking. This is pretty hard. I cannot do it. Uh, but if you, you can have the computer do it. So you just read equations. So you represent an equation, for example, as a tree. This is x minus three times sine of x uh, minus seven. So it's an expression. Uh, and uh, so you, you start with random expressions and you measure the error, let's say the RMS error. And uh, over time, you get better and better close, uh, closer to the data. So, so this is symbolic regression. This is classic symbolic regression invented in 1992. Uh, it's Stanford, John Colza, the Cambridge is famous for other reasons. Uh, but uh, it works, uh, but there's only one problem. It doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? For the same reason many other machine learning systems don't work. It's too slow and it overfits. Now you can sleep through a talk on AI and ask, how does it overcome scaling and overfit? Right? It's always a good question. And this thing falls into these pits right away. It overfits and it takes a lot of compute power because you need to compare every function against all the data, it doesn't scale. Uh, so, so what do we do about it? So we took, we made one tiny change and uh, we brought that coevolution back. So instead of testing this every model across an entire data set, we only tested it on a few numbers, a few points, maybe eight out of a thousand. From which eight should we choose? Should we choose them randomly? Should we sample every other node? Now we chose the nodes, we bred the nodes that caused the most disagreement between models, right? So we choose the nodes that cause the most disagreement. So as the models get better and better, these nodes move around, right? So again, we're trying to sort of defeat the models by bringing data points that sort of pull out the disagreement between these models because those data points will tell us which model is right and which one is wrong. Uh, and so when, this is one of the first times we ran this, this is some code. Uh, this is work by Michael Schmidt, a uh, student who came in to do just this, and you can see the points moving around. Uh, and this is real time, and you know, this is video from 2010, it's a very low resolution. But if you look at this, here you can see it finds the equation, it finds that x times sine x very, very quickly, sine x times sine very, very quickly. You find the right solution a lot faster than if you did it in the entire data set. In fact, if you look at the number, the total computational effort to get to zero error and evolution, we like it fitness to go up, like things to go up. If you take the entire data set, you know, it takes a long time and you don't get the solution. Uh, if you do random points with noise and all the things we talked about, it improves with time. But if you co evolve the points to create this agreement between the models, you find the solution faster and more accurately than any other method. And I would argue that this idea about adding noise is a proxy to this. And in fact, if instead of just adding noise, you add noise that deliberately defeats the models, we do even better. So that's the difference between more, adding noise is a set for that direction. But that adversarial relationship between the model and the data makes it work better. It's a bit like a, Again, like a professor that changes the equation, the, the questions in the exam in order to make sure that half the students pass and half fail. All right. And that's the bent, or, you know, that's the best question. A question that everybody gets right, everybody gets wrong, is not good for telling who knows and who doesn't know. An equation that differentiates is a good question in an exam. And that's what this process is doing. And this is why it keeps things uh, moving forward. So, so this is really strange. Because we tend to think that more data is better. But in fact, you take less data, but the right data, you get a much better model than if you just throw all the data at the system. 
So this this adversarial relationship allows the data, the right data to reveal itself through the modeling process. And also for the same accuracy, if you use entire data set, you get complex models. Uh, if you use part of the cobalt data set, you get simpler models. So you get for the same accuracy. Simple model, same accuracy, must be closer to the truth. Right, so, so you overcome a little bit of that overfitting. So it looks that we have a winner. Like this algorithm looks really good. So what I'm going to do with it? Uh, so try to predict the stock market. Now uh, I feel here, right? So this obviously didn't work. <laughs> so, uh, but it did work for other people because it, you have to have the right data. It didn't work well. So we said, okay, uh, let's uh, try to predict. Find a formula. For uh, the rent for, for the prime numbers. That's going to get you pretty, you get Nobel Prize. Uh, but we can find that either. <laughs> All right? So we can find, so we're not going to get rich or famous, right? So we said, okay, let's uh, let's uh, write some papers. <laughs> so we wrote some papers, uh, and uh, I had an email from CERN, the uh, particle accelerator in Geneva, uh, in, in France, or Switzerland, France. And uh, they said, we have the perfect data for you. It's uh, we have a binding energy gap in the atomic nuclei. I'm not sure what that is exactly, but they gave me a spreadsheet and they said, find the formula. So we run it, we hit enter, and we find a formula that's good for three to three digits. And, you know, we're very pleased. I send an email, and, you know, triumphant email. And uh, I get back uh, within five seconds, the email back, uh, and the guy says, uh, we already know about this formula. It's called y sacros formula, and our formula is good to four digits. <laughs> right. So he was very disappointed, but I'm actually very, very interested. I was very encouraged because then we can find main formulas. If we just get the right data, we can name it whatever we want. <laughs> right? So this is an incredible tool. Even the, the provost was interested in it, the naming opportunity. So, but we wanted to kick, out, kick it up a notch and see if we can model dynamical systems. So the only difference between fitting straight data, static data, and fitting a dynamical system, as Steve said earlier, is just uh, time. So dynamical systems uh, are data that's much in time. So we compute the derivative of that data, and now we have a uh, differential equation that's static, uh, and we can fit the differential equation. So it's very simple. Uh, we went on and we took uh, the seven differential equations that describe the glycolysis cycle in, in the cell. And again, I don't know exactly what that means, but I don't care. Seven differential equations are very complicated. Don't mean, yeah. We took the data, we generated, we took the equation, generated data, sprinkled noise on it, and ran it, and bound, we get the equations back in about four hours with one term there that's wrong, but a little bit small. Okay, so again, very powerful tool. These are coupled nonlinear differential equations. Uh, we can derive them on a data with a great hammer. Uh, we're now looking for. So uh, here's another example. This is work with Charlie uh, Richter, who was a master student at the time. Floris, maybe a little lot with you, I don't remember. Uh, and uh, he was developing these flapping wing. Uh, robots that flap, so we do a lot of robotics work. These are like mosquitoes that flap their wings and they fall in place. Very cool device. But part of the physics there is trying to understand how the wing, the aeroelastic behavior of the wing, the lift, and it's very complex, turbulent, elastic, you know, crazy stuff. Uh, and we say, okay, let's see if our system can create a model of this, uh, of this, of this behavior. Uh, so we collect all the data and we get some interesting results. But I'm not going to show you. The actual equation, because that's going to be boring. I want to, what I want to do is compare it to state of the art. So I'm going to compare it around two axes that I think are the most important axes for all of science. And that is accuracy and complexity. So everybody can create models of anything they want. The question is how accurate is your model and how complex is the model? And there's a lot of combinations. That works. So you can have models that are simple, but they're not very accurate. It's, really, it's, it's, it's good. Uh, they're good because they're simple. And it, frankly, some of these very simple models are, are good enough and they're very useful. You have models that are very, very, uh, very accurate, but they're complex and we use them for other things. And that's also okay. And there's a lot of room in between those. 
The noble laureates live there. Is e equal mc squared. Accurate and simple. This is what we all want to get. However, unfortunately, most of us end up here. <laughs> uh, we get a PhD for it, a, a thick thesis, but uh, it's complicated and inaccurate. But you can compare models on the scale for any physical, for any phenomenon you want, from economics to, to, to biology. So where do the models of the aeroelastic lift that our system created? So here are different models from the literature. Every model here is somebody's career. Every doctor's career trying to model aeroelastic lift. And here are the models created by our system. And what's important about these models is that they are simpler and more accurate than models created by these experts. Simpler and more accurate, meaning they're closer to the truth. And this is what all of this search is about. It's about finding models that are simple and accurate and closer to the truth. We are, that's what we're after. We're not just after prediction. We want insight, and this is what we're after. Here are polynomial models of different uh, scales. This should give you uh, an idea. We are the right side of the tracks. So. Okay, another student comes in and says, I'm going to do a PhD on road tire interaction. Okay, why do you want to do road tire interaction? I, probably safety, right? Uh, I thought safety is you know, a good reason. They said, no, I want to do a road tire interaction because it's important for video games. Uh, okay, that's a bigger industry than safety. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and he was able to create models that are more accurate uh, and simpler than state of the art models for road tire interaction uh, used uh, in gaming and, in, uh, and, and for safety. So, uh, so again, lots of applications for this. So I was going around giving a talk just like this, and I would stop here and I would beg for data. I'd say, I have a hammer, I'm looking for nails. If you have data, give me the data, and we'll regress it, we'll give you a ball, we'll write a paper about this. Uh, and it turns out, it's hard to get data from people. They say, no, you give me the problem. I say, no, you give me the data. <laughs> you go back and forth. And it's very hard to get to pry data out of people, very hard to pry code uh, out of software developers. And this is sort of being part of the challenge. And data is a challenge. One of the things we're trying to do in this center is make data available so that people with tools can start hammering and finding out what happens. But uh, rural Sewell, University of Texas Southwestern at the time, came to me and said, I have the perfect data set for you. I've been studying uh, the Sirius Subtilis. I'm not sure what that is, but it sounds, it sounds pretty cool to me. <laughs> and uh, he measures uh, some markers, how they have to go up and down over time with genetic markers. But the important thing, he measures them cell by cell. So it's not a bat with a billion cells, S single cell at a time. And he's got uh, 60 cells, and he has these two markers going up and down. He says, find them all that describes the dynamics of these two things. Uh, there might be different coefficients for different cells, but it's one, two, couple differential equations, find it, and you write a paper. And it gives me the spreadsheet. Fantastic. So we take the data, we put it in our system, we hit enter, and we wait. And eventually, a week later, we come back with these two equations. All right, so I send these, I don't know what this means, so I send the equation to Gorol and he, he knows me back five seconds later and says, this is total garbage. <laughs> Doesn't mean anything. Biological systems don't have second order equations anyway. This is, you're, you're thinking like a physicist in biology. This is, doesn't make any sense. So we're kind of depressed. Uh, we're thinking, okay, we're doing something wrong here. What are we doing wrong? So we figured out, first of all, we're using sine and cosine as a building block. Biology doesn't have sine and cosine. It's physics. So we're missing some other building blocks. And we'll talk about building blocks later, but understanding what the building blocks are is where the scientists come in. So the symbolic regression relies on you giving it the right operators to play around with. And so uh, we figured out that probably we're missing time delays. Biology has a lot of time delays. Nothing happens exactly. It's not a pendulum. You know? It happens whenever it happens. The time delay, diffusion, things like that. We put in time delays, and bam, 
two beautiful equations that explain the target. I email these two equations to Grohl and he emails me back and says, you have a problem. They are simpler and more accurate <laughs> than the paper I published a few years ago. <laughs> but there's only one problem. We don't know what these equations mean. Grohl knows exactly what everything here means, but I couldn't explain anything about this. Nothing. It's like copying homework. You have the right answer, but you can't explain how you got it. <laughs> and it's a challenge. And this is part of the future. We are surrendering our insight to AI. We get the answer. It's, a, it's, a, it's sort of a deal with the devil. If we're not careful, we're going to end up with things that are accurate, so accurate that they render our entire knowledge of sleep. But we can't explain how they work. But they work. These equations are fantastic. They work. Uh, they, they work on uh, correctly on new cell lines, and, and they, they're correct. But we don't know what they mean. In fact, we couldn't publish this. We haven't published this yet because every time we try to publish it, the reviewers say, "If you don't understand what it means, we're not publishing." You can't do this. And so we're going to have to fake it. You know, come up. We're going to use GPT three. Come up with some clothes to explain what this is because we can't explain uh, what it is. So that brings me to the last piece of the puzzle, which is searching for meaning. And this is the difference between us scientists and business people who just want predictions. And I'm not talking about this kind of searching for meaning, I'm talking <laughs> about meaning of what the equations actually describe and why the equations are the way they are. What's behind it? What's the inside? So business people just want predictions. For example, uh, correlations. Uh, a real data set uh, shows that people, this is, I didn't make this up, people that buy uh, uh, diapers are Thursday evenings also by beer. The correlations. If you're running a supermarket, you don't care why. You just move the diaper next to the beers and it's okay. Right? But we want to know why. We just we don't just want to make predictions. We want to understand inside. And so to understand inside, we want to do something a little bit deeper. Uh, and uh, in order to find uh, a deeper model, we want to understand what is not changing. So here the, here the time, we want to find invariance and some really old paper from 100 years ago that talk about science is all about finding what is not changing, what is invariant. So I'm showing you here this pendulum. This pendulum has two variables, angle and angular velocity, both changing as a function of time, angle and angular velocity. I'm asking you what combination of these variables is not changing? Is there some constant? Is there ratio constant? No. What is not changing about these two variables? Anybody? The energy. That's the period constant. Perfect. That was faster than ever before. <laughs> the equation that describes the energy, the total kinetic and potential energy of the system is not changing the time. It's called the Hamiltonian. Uh, this is the Hamiltonian is not changing with time, it's invariant. If you know the energy of the system, if you have a concept of energy, you understand everything there is to know about the system. But if you don't know that, just predicting angle and angle velocity, you'll never get to the meaning to the real physics of a pendulum. If you know the Hamiltonian, you can figure out the bifurcations, you know everything about the, the, the risk of our pendulum. All right, so we said, okay, this is simple. We're going to change our evolutionary algorithm to search for a function that is invariant across the entire data. It's really easy. We change the fitness function. This is for a double pendulum. We're measuring four variables. We're asking what function of these four variables is not changing across the entire data. Okay, so we reward it for minimum, minimizing variance. We hit enter and we win. Wait for a week, and finally the result comes. <laughs> it's a function. It's constant, but it's not changing. It's not changing across the entire data set. It's constant. 
Now, this is a great uh, function, but it's not what we want. We want a function that actually uses the variables. Okay, so so uh, we we penalize it for not using the variables. And we hit enter, and we get this. <laughs> right. So what do we do with this? Uh, okay, so another student walks in the lab and says, I have this symbolic, this special uh, symbolic algebra toolkit and it can find these things and cancel them out and it's going to work. So we, we add in the system and we run it again and we get this. Now this is slightly more complicated. You can't move the x squared out of this thing, but it's basically 42. <laughs> right? So the system is like a teenager, right? You, you, you can argue all day, but you don't get what you want. But this, is, this is exactly this is where we are. We, we can't get the system to give us a meaningful invariant. We get all kinds of, and this is the challenge. There are infinite number of invariants, but finding the real invariant is tricky. So I did what uh, most professors would do at this uh, point, which is I gave it uh, as homework. <laughs> uh, I really did. This was the homework assignment. I said there's an invariant for each of these. Find what the fitness function is for the invariant. Now, I did give it as a bonus question, just to be fair. Uh, but once you had uh, Michael Schmidt came back and said, uh, it's easy. Uh, all you have to do is this, this, and that. And it comes back with equation. So I opened his homework assignment. And it turns out that he figured out that if you have, if you can compute the partial derivatives of the x, dy, dy, dx, and you have a candidate from the data, you have a candidate function f, and you do the f, dx, dx, dy, the ratio between them also gives you the x, dy. You compare them, and the system cannot cheat. The f has to be meaningful. If you put 42 here, you don't get anything that, is, that it, it doesn't match. Uh, and uh, we try it out on a bunch of different things. And here it is. Uh, here's the, the uh, a sim uh, simple oscillator for physics 101. We collect the data with a little webcam uh, and we ask what is not changing about the thing. And it comes back with these two things. We show the Hamiltonian and the Lagrangian. The Lagrangian also, uh, you get you get a Lagrangian for free for a single oscillator. Cool. We put in a pendulum uh, and we want, we ask what's not changing. This is not changing. Right, the Hamiltonian of the pendulum. Uh, we kick it up a notch and take a double oscillator with three springs. What is not changing about the red and green curve? It's pretty hard. It's a graduate physics, but this is not changing. This is the Hamiltonian of a double oscillator. Yeah, we don't know anything about this, but it seems to work. And then behind the scenes, there's all this coevolution. Uh, so we go back uh, and we try the double pendulum. This uh, this double pendulum that we failed on before. This is Steve Strogatz with his double pendulum. Uh, crazy behavior. We collect the data uh, with a Blackhorn camera and LEDs in the dark. Beautiful pictures. Uh, and we said, what is not changing about this? Uh, so here's the actual data. And uh, this is a visualization of how the search goes all these trees. It's not actually trees, these are graphs of all kinds of operators and variables. And uh, after a while uh, of this working, we get this, we get the Hamiltonian of the double pendulum, we get conservation of momentum, which is true for high energy swings. Uh, we get F equal and A, we get everything you want to know about pendulum. All from the data set. All there. This is the complexity versus accuracy. And you can see it started off with all kinds of things and eventually, and here's, here are the interesting uh, answers at the bottom of cliffs. You get the, the interesting answers. So that's an AI scientist. And you can see that did a lot, a lot of experiments to figure this out. Now you might ask me, okay, so if you look for invariants and that data that we said, what happened? So we actually found the invariants of these cells. Turns out, that it's called the competency of the cell. The cell maintains almost like an index of how stressed the cell is. And when it's stressed, it exchanges genetic material with other cells. And when it's not stressed, it doesn't do that. Okay, the viruses that we all know and love do this, all right? 
And that equation describes the competency level, that invariant is the competency level of the cell, and it works exactly that is the meaning of those dynamics. So we cracked it. We still didn't publish it because everybody graduated. Uh, but we know the answer because we look for invariants. So I showed you examples with, with Newtonian mechanics and with biology, but you can apply this to everything. There were early, earlier questions about uh, stochasticity, and I wanted to just I put in these slides in response to that. You can change the building blocks. Instead of just plus, minus, divide, multiply, constants, and variables, you add noise as the building blocks, and you get stochastic models. And stochastic models, in my mind, are very important because if you can model Trying to model a flipping coin all day long, and you're not going to get it right. And you think you're doing a bad job in modeling, but it's not your fault. It's the system itself that's stochastic, and you'll never get that error down. I think you have a stochastic model, you'll get it perfect. You'll predict the distributions accurately. So all you need is to change the building blocks, and you get stochastic models. These are reaction models that describe chemistry. So the, that's my answer to noise is not to try harder but to build stochasticity into the modeling process uh, these are uh, these are hybrid systems that have multiple equations for different situations i mean you can put any building blocks you want as a scientist and see what models you get and each one of these slides is somebody's phd trying to figure that out so there's a lot of interesting questions out there a lot of work uh, to do but there's one last thing that really, really mad at us all this time. And that is, we looked at this double, this pendulum swinging here, and I'm asking, how did we know that angle and angle velocity are the two things to measure? Once we measure angle and angle velocity, we can throw in all this symbolic regression stuff and we get the answer. But how do we, did we know that angle and angle velocity are two things to measure? And if you think back about science, most of human history, we didn't know what to measure. The idea of measuring temperature is recent, like 100 years ago. The, re the, the idea of measuring velocity is recent. And before you know what to measure, if you don't know what to measure, you can't create models to begin with, no matter how fancy your AI is. So how can we automate that? Can we have a system that just looks at the double pendulum like this, scratches its head and says, there's two things here, angle and angle law. Maybe you won't give them names, I'll give you two things. Is that possible? So we first built a system that takes a video of a double pendulum and predicts the future frames. And you can do that. That's not hard. And it does it pretty well. This is a prediction of a double pendulum about half a second in advance. So you can do that pretty well. This is modern deep learning, very powerful. Deep down inside that big neural network with a billion nodes, it must know something about angle and angle velocity. It's there. If it can predict the double pendulum, it knows. It's our goal to interrogate the big neural network and extract that information out there. Robin Michael Show is talking about this, extracting from the neural network what the neural network uh, knows. So the way we do this, the long story, but the, here's the gist of the idea. If you can, if you do an auto encoder that goes from two frames to the next two frames through a throttle, the state variables are okay. Now how how far can you squeeze that that throttle there? If you squeeze it a little bit, it can make a good prediction. If you squeeze it into one number, it can't do it. You can't predict the next frame with one number. You squeeze it to four, it can do it. You go to five, it can do it. Three, it cannot do it. So the answer is there are four variables, state variables, and if you squeeze it to four, you'll get those four variables. Now, how now there's a, there's a lot of Details on how you do the squeezing, it's not easy. There's a lot of stages and all, all that. But basically, how, how fine can you squeeze that problem and give you those sort of numbers? Now, will those numbers be angle and angle velocity? Maybe. Maybe they're going to be something else. Maybe they're going to be energy. Maybe they're going to be angle squared. They're going to be something, but you'll be able to figure out that there are four variables that you're going to get a hint, a suggestion 
about what they are. The other thing we find out is that the order of the system is determined by how many frames are needed in order to make the prediction. A double pendulum, you cannot predict with just one frame. It's a second order system, you need two frames. Some systems, you need three frames. If you don't have three frames, you can't do it. So the number of frames is the order, and the size of a flow is, the, is the, the state space. And that gives you a handle on this, to me, the most elusive question, which is you observe something, what are the variables that govern that system? So I, I show you this fire and I ask you how many state variables are in this fire? It turns out there's a lot of these on YouTube. I'm not sure why. It's relaxing, uh, but uh, they're good for science. They're very complex. We can predict them pretty accurately. Like, I'm amazed I can do it at all. The work that Bo did, and I, I said, uh, you know, uh, check it again. There's no way the AI, can, to me, fire looks random. Okay, that's because I have a tiny brain, right? So the AI can predict how the flames are going to unfold. It's amazing, even more than half a second now. Uh, but when we ask you, the AI says there are 26 variables. Yeah. And it says what they are. So we give them names, the naming opportunity. <laughs> but we give us 26 variables. And it's amazing. And this is the key to future of physics. I mean, we do this on all kinds of things. And these are all predictions, air dances, and chem chemistry, and this crazy dynamics, and lava lamp, and this elastic double pendulum, like a nightmare from a uh, you know, PhD and I know what, I mean, all of these, and it can do it. And it can say, it can say this elastic double pendulum has six state variables. And here they are. In fact, here, here are some examples. Here are things what we know, what the answer is. Here's what it says, pretty close. And for these systems, we don't know for the fire, it says, oh, sorry, 24.7 variables. What they are, we don't know, but this is the future of science. So let me just sum up and say, you know, let's zoom out and say, okay, we are at a paradigm shift in how we do science. Now, I was looking for a, a slide on history of mathematical modeling. I couldn't find anything, but I found this slide on mathematical notation. And it turns out that we humans have started describing things mathematically for less than a thousand years. I mean, the plus sign was invented in the 14th century. The plus sign, sure, people added money and votes and things before that, but the idea of writing it down as a relationship, mathematical relationship, until the 14th century, nobody thought of doing that. It took 200 years to do the minus. This is how slow it goes. Uh, okay, exponents, 1560. I mean, then it came fast, and we're here. In 1960, it was all done, all right? So this is the history of mathematical model. It's brief. If you zoom out, and I couldn't find anything like that, what was before mathematical modeling? How do people model things? Well, there was 3,000 years of models with geometry, like Egyptians and Greek. Before that, I didn't know what models we used, myths to describe the world. But what's the future? So we are here. How are we going to describe future physical systems? And I believe that the future is going to be all using AI. We are at the end of what we can do manually using all these fancy operators by scratching our head and rubbing our chin. We're going to have to hand over to AI. We're going to give up on all these beautiful operators. Uh, and we're going to uh, give control to the AI, and the AI is going to do the science for us. And, and this is this is the transition period, and uh, you're going to uh, be uh, sort of at this transition period. And this is going to be increasingly important because computing power, upon which this all lies, is going exponentially. This is computing power since 1900 in gigaflops per dollar. This is Moore law, but this is real Moore's law. This is real data. I plotted it on a linear scale. Look at where we are today compared to 10 years ago. Isn't it amazing? Like I can't get I can't get enough of this chart. I mean, look, people in 2012 are almost indistinguishable from 1950 compared to where we are today. 
But if you fast forward 10 years, watch the scale on the left. 10 years. This is the prediction, same way. This is where we're going to be. We'll look back at the day and laugh. So this is computing power. And our brain is not following this curve, but AI is. And this is why whatever we do today is going to carry us into the future. So this is AI, but even steeper than AI is the growth of data, which is growing, has a doubling period of six months. And even faster than that is the doubling period of AI models. This is a recent paper of the size of AI models out there in papers, doubling every three and a half months. That makes Moore's law look up like a flat line. So AI, data, so computing power, data, and AI models are accelerating at an incredible rate. And the more we can handle, the better. Uh, New York Times uh, has written about our work and other people's work. Theoretical physicists are not yet obsolete, but scientists are taking steps towards replacing themselves. It's partially true, but I maintain that actually scientists are still going to be needed first to collect the data, but also <laughs> to give meaning to this all. Right? The AI, the one thing AI does not have is, is sort of the incentive to do this situation. And as long as we remain there, we can try this. Thank you. All right, floor is open for questions. Please wander up to the mic. You're on the air. Hi, thanks for the great talk. Um, it's a question about um, the last uh, few slides um, before the prediction. So, did you try applying symbolic projection on the latent diagram you got from the bottom floor? Yeah. And okay, did we try? Yes. Yeah, so we can do we can do predictions uh, with you mean yeah with the like get an equation from uh, the, yes so we tried to run symbolic regression on and and we we didn't we we didn't get anything clean we got something uh, so uh, but it's not a nice uh, equation so I think there is something um, deeper about so probably the fact that we choose angle and angular velocity. It, Probably it's a good choice. Now, uh, the AI chose something else that wasn't very clean. Now, why did uh, AI choose? What, why is angular angle velocity a good choice? We're not sure. So actually, Bo and I, we talked about this. And Nathan, we talked about this also. Uh, we think maybe angular angle velocity are smooth variables. Uh, and therefore, the good state variables, other, other state variables, even if they're good for prediction, they're not as smooth. So we have there's more to the story. But I think we're very close. And if we get it right, we'll pick the right kind of variables over there. I had a question about the uh, slide you showed about the growth in computing power. Yeah. I guess maybe you could elaborate a little bit. I have a hard time reconciling this with like the recent sort of swelling of the blah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Th that's, that's fake. Sort of confusing, you know, need for specialization. Yeah, yeah. So actually, so so this so Moore, so Moore's law originally was about transistors per square inch, right. uh, but this is computing power per dollar, which is a different thing. This is mostly GPUs. Okay. So are those, are those like low precision? No, they're they're high precision. They just take more space. They're they're, they're they're great, but they're very powerful. So you can't just take you know sorting algorithm. Actually, sorting algorithm you can, but they're, they're you can't just invert a matrix on them. Uh, but since it's involved progression or machine learning is, is great. So, uh, so, more, so computing power per dollar is increasing exponentially through these parallel GPUs. This is how Google does it, DeepMind GPUs. And there are other technologies on the way to make that continue, like the products, computing the lives and like. So don't, don't, if somebody tells you more lives dead, let them think that. So with regard to still learning the right variables, can you evolve or even co-evolve those variables as well? Yeah, it's a great that's a great idea. So you can you can 
uh, from raw data. So, so again, doing this from raw data, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a good idea. Somebody should try that. Uh, awesome presentation. I was wondering about the, the noise model. That was really interesting. Uh, what's the fitness for that noise model? Uh, the matching between the distributions. Okay, so you want the distributions to match up. So, so you basically like MCMC MC, MC, and MC. Yes, yes, yeah. Do you imagine? Yeah, so it's a, it's more expensive. Yeah, and and uh, if you so you can, so you can so we have a couple of papers for this, but you can match different orders, different moments of the distribution, uh, and and that's your fitness. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. Do you pick the points that? The most different from the current model, the change in model, some of the points which is the most different. How do you know that you don't go into an infinite loop? Great, great. That's a terrific question. So coevolution has this problem where you can get models that learn uh, to explain the, the data and they forget what they knew before because they're not being asked, right? Uh, so that's that. Uh, so you're absolutely right. If you're not careful, that happens. Uh, but in practice, it doesn't happen if you have a large enough data set. Like I picked, uh, we picked uh, about 16 points, and that was enough that it didn't happen. But it could theoretically happen. It's no, uh, and some people, this paper is about uh, Hall of Fame techniques where you always keep one point. Uh, you know, every so often you keep a point uh, just so that nobody forgets how to solve it. And, uh, uh, and so that way you don't go into silence. But absolutely right. If you're not careful, you might get into silence. One more question here. Very nice talk. Thank you. I'm curious about the earlier part where the talk would say that when she has a self model, like how do we represent that self model? Yeah, so, so when we have robots that have self models, so we've gone through a dozen different uh, approaches for self modeling. The earliest, uh, model with, with a, with a four-legged robot, the model was a stick figure. And it knew, we knew the Newtonian mechanics, we give it and, and it just has to figure out the topology. That was in 2010. Uh, uh, about three years ago, we represented the model as just a, uh, just a, a blank neural network that gets in the mortal commands and it predicts the position of the end effector. All right, so very, so it's, it's a black box and it's just uh, somehow in there, there's the dynamics in the kinematics. Uh, and the most recent work that I showed, which we haven't published yet, the model is basically is predicting a occupancy, a density function basically, which is uh, given the state of the robot, the angles of all the joints, what part of, and what part of the, the world is this robot gonna occupy? So you give it an X, Y, Z, Point and it tells you is there a robot there or not, and that's a probability density function, and that's what that fog is. It's sort of okay, and that fog changes based on what the motor commands are. The fog will move, and I think, you know, who knows how we humans see ourselves, but we have some notion of where we are in the world if we close our eyes, and it's not precise. It's this kind of foggy thing, and I think, I think that's it's similar. Uh, so we're going to take a quick break here of about 15 minutes, and we're going to get set up for the panel discussion. So it's, uh, we can continue to ask questions both the pod and the other But let's thank Todd once again. Thank you. Thank you.